Longfellow's famous poem, Paul Revere's Ride, celebrates a feat of daring that has become a milestone in American history. But the poet took some liberties with the facts. This is the real story of what happened on that exciting night. It was April 1775. British troops patrolled the American colonies. Boston was under martial law. Since the Boston Tea Party, only British men of war could enter Boston Harbor. The colonies seethed with unrest. Many of the patriots, as they were called, demanded freedom from English oppression, some even at the cost of war. One of the leaders of a secret committee of patriots was a silversmith named Paul Revere. He had taken part in the Boston Tea Party. He spied on the British and often served as a secret express rider to carry patriot messages. A fine Boston home had been taken over as headquarters for General Gage, the British governor and commander of the British troops. Many people of Boston did not object to British rule and called themselves loyalists. Some actually informed the British of patriot plans. So it was that General Gage learned that the two chief colonial leaders of Massachusetts, Samuel Adams and John Hancock, had fled from Boston and set up temporary headquarters in Lexington. He also learned that the colonial arms and munitions were being stored at the nearby town of Concord. Gage decided that he had to stop this growing rebellion without letting it explode into actual fighting. Concord lies about 14 miles to the north and west of Boston, across the Charles River. General Gage had two choices. He could reach Concord by ferrying his troops across the mouth of the Charles River to Charlestown and then travel by land to Lexington and Concord. or he could send his forces by land around the bay formed by the river, cross the bridge, and travel on to Lexington and Concord. His decision made, Gage ordered secret preparations for a march. But the secret could not be kept completely. Patriot spies soon learned of the preparations, but they could not be sure of their purpose. They decided to warn Adams and Hancock of possible danger. That Sunday, April 16th, 1775, Paul Revere rode to Lexington, noon jaunt. Although he warned Adams and Hancock, they decided to stay in Lexington as long as possible. That evening, on his way back to Boston, Revere stopped at the home of a friend in Charlestown, Mr. Conant, another patriot leader. Conant had important news. He explained that during the day, the British had moved their man of war, the Somerset, to a position directly between Boston and Charlestown. This might be a sign that the expected attack would come soon. Before leaving, he arranged with Conant that when the British marched, Revere would have a signal flashed from the steeple of the old North Church in Boston, which could be seen from Conant's home in Charlestown. He would also try to signal the route of the attack. If the British were coming by land, the longer route, one light would be flashed. But if by sea, the shorter route, that is across the river, the signal would be two lights. Revere himself, an experienced express rider, would then try to get away to spread the alarm. Should Revere be captured crossing the river, Conant would ride in his place. On Tuesday evening, April 18th, Revere finally learned that the British would move by water, the shorter route, that very night. There was no time to lose. He aroused the sexton of the old North Church, Robert Newman, who already knew of the plan. Newman agreed to give the signal. Then Revere left to try to cross the river to Charlestown without being captured. Newman, in the words of Longfellow's poem, Climbed the tower of the old North Church by the wooden stairs with stealthy tread to the belfry chamber overhead. He gave the signal. Across the river, Conant and a trusted friend saw the two lights. It was not Revere who saw the signal, as in the poem. At this moment, Revere was being silently rowed across the river close past the British man of war.
the Somerset. Conan had almost decided to go on himself, even though he was not an experienced express rider. When at last, Revere appeared. Then, on a borrowed horse, Paul Revere rode toward Lexington to spread the alarm. As in Longfellow's poem, the fate of a nation was riding that night, and the spark struck out by that steed in his flight kindled the land into flame with its heat. This was the last night of peace for eight long years. After arousing the countryside between Charlestown and Lexington, Revere finally reached the parsonage where Adams and Hancock were staying. By warning them in time, Revere enabled them to escape to Philadelphia. This major reason for his ride is not mentioned in Longfellow's poem. From here on, history is quite different from the poem. For Revere was not the only rider on that historic night. A half hour later, another rider got through to the parsonage. He was William Dawes, who had taken the longer land route in case Revere was captured by the Somerset. With Adams and Hancock safely warned, Revere and Dawes left together to finish their mission by warning Concord. In spite of danger from British patrols, the two men continued to alert homes on their route. Later on the road, they encountered another rider, Dr. Samuel Prescott. They soon learned that he was a true patriot, eager to help them in their dangerous mission. Together they rode on toward Concord. Then they ran into one of the British patrols. Seeing an opening, Prescott spurred his horse forward and headed down the road. He escaped to warn Concord. Dawes got away too. But the British had surrounded Revere. They started back with him toward Lexington. But fearing trouble and anxious to return to their base, they decided to release him. They took Revere's horse and cut the saddle and bridle of the horse they left him. But Revere's mission was already accomplished. In all the countryside around, patriots were taking up their guns and hurrying to Lexington and Concord, ready for battle. It was the hour before the birth of a nation, April 19, 1775, on Lexington Green, the assembled patriots were fired on by British troops. Overnight, the long debate had turned into revolution. Later that day, at Concord Bridge, the British met organized resistance. And as the poem says, you know the rest in the books you have read, how the British regulars fired and fled. Adams and Hancock reached Philadelphia where they served as Massachusetts delegates to the Second Continental Congress. On July 4, 1776, it was John Hancock, chairman of the Congress, who first put his bold signature on the Declaration of Independence. Perhaps he thought then of Paul Revere and that famous ride of April 18, 1775. So is recorded the real story of Paul Revere's ride. Longfellow's poem, though it differs from some of the facts, captures the spirit of that famous ride in these final words. Through all our history to the last, in the hour of darkness and peril and need, the people will waken and listen to hear the hurry beats of that 
and the midnight message of Paul Revere.